Good evening. We have looked at Abraham extensively. We have studied Abraham in terms of basically his life, the beginning, his failures in terms of dealing with Sarah, with dealing with Pharaoh, with dealing with uh, those who come after. We've looked at his great faith. We have looked at Abraham and we have discussed everything that Abraham has done that opened the door, led the way for the Israelites to become the nation they are, and how God is with him in every step. Uh, we have reached the part of the book of Genesis where we're now going to see the end of Abraham's life. So we'd like to have one final study. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 23 and then 25. We're going to skip chapter 24 while Abraham does play a small part. In chapter 24 ultimately chapter 24 is about Isaac getting a wife and we're going to study that next week but starting in Genesis chapter 23 we're going to find out that the, the account of Abraham begins with tragedy that begins with the death of Sarah and it's a very fitting tribute you see Sarah lived 127 years these were the years of the life of Sarah so Sarah died in Kerjath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abram, Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. You know, he lost his wife. We understand that. We understand the concept there. We see that he is weeping, that he is mourning and sorrowful for that which he's lost. And he goes to the people and he says, I would like to buy a plot. I would like to have somewhere that I can bury my dead. Understand, Abraham is a sojourner. While he has extensive flocks and animals, during this time, they didn't necessarily buy land. They didn't own land, really. So Abraham, he doesn't have somewhere that he can really say, this is my burial area. So he goes to the inhabitants, to the people who own this land. He goes, look, I need somewhere. I need a place in which I can bury those who I love, those who have died. I need, I need somewhere I can put them. And then in verse 12, we see this really amazing point. In Genesis 23, verse 12, Then Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land, and he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If you will give it, please hear me. I will give you money for the field. Take it from me, and I will bury my dead there. You see, Moses had become such an important individual, not Moses, Abraham, sorry. Abraham had become such an important individual in this region, in this area, that when he lost Sarah, they're like, oh, just take it. What's, what is it? And he goes, it's only 400 shekels of silver. He goes, well, what's that between you and I, they said. Don't worry about it. Just take the field. And Abraham said, no, I'm going to buy it. And it's a very important lesson that we can learn from there. When something is important to us, it's worth the cost. You know, I believe we talked about this a little bit when we were doing our, our discussion of giving. But David, when he went to worship God, when it was something that was important to him, he said, I cannot give to God that which costs me nothing. It was not a sacrifice for him. We need to understand, we realize that if something's important to us, we are willing, we desire to pay the cost. And in a very fitting tribute to Sarah, Abraham said, look, I want to own it. I want to pay for it. I want to have this land so that I can do right by the woman that I loved. So he goes and he pays for the land. In verse 19, we see that after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, before Mabram, that is in Hebrew, in the land of, the, of the land of Canaan. So he buys the land. He buries her. He mourns his wife. And we see that Abraham is now alone. Chapter 24, as I mentioned earlier, Abraham is old. He's an old man who has realized that he has an heir that does not have a wife, an heir that does not have children, and he's going to have to fix that. So in 24, which we'll study next week, Abraham sends his servant to go find a wife for Isaac. He basically says, I don't want him to marry someone here. I want him to find someone of my family, of my people. 
and I want you to go and find someone of that nature for me. So, during this time, now understand, Abraham is old. He was 100 years old when Isaac was married, when Isaac was born. But after some time passes, Abraham gets a new wife. And it's kind of interesting. And it's, you wonder about it. The Bible doesn't tell us why. The Bible gives no information concerning why he marries this individual. He ends up having, um, basically she is referred to as a concubine. That's the, the status and the, and the idea that's placed on her children. But in chapter 25, starting in verse 1, we read, Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Kirchen. And she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Median, Midian, Isbak, and Sura, and Susha. Joshkan begot Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Assyrium, Lithium, Lilium. And the sons of Midian were Ephar, Ether, Hanak, Abadiah, and Eladah. All these were the children of, Ker of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. That's important. He gives everything to Isaac. The rest of this reads, But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from Isaac to son, to the country of the east. Now this gives us the idea that there were more than one group, and that these are the only sons that he mentions. Uh, some scholars believe that Abraham had taken concubines on top of this wife, and that he had multiple sons, multiple children that we're not hearing about. But what's important, we want to look at these children, because here's the deal. Some of these children we know a little bit about. We understand what they will end up being. And remember, Abraham was made a promise that his descendants would be as numerous as the sand on the seashore, that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky, that his people would be a great and mighty nation. And he was told concerning Ishmael, this will happen to you as well. Because Ishmael is your son, he will become a mighty nation. And I believe that there was 11 or 12 princes that rise up after Ishmael, his descendants, and they go and they create these lands, and they, they become these great mighty nations. And we talked a few weeks ago about the fact that Ishmael would be a constant thorn in the side of the Israelites. But guess what? So were these people. Just to consider it, Midian will become the Midianites. I'm sure if from our study on Wednesday nights, when we look through the Old Testament, you might remember that name. Now, the Midianites are not constantly referenced, but we know that they are involved in the purchase of Joseph when his brothers go to sell him into slavery in Genesis chapter 37. They are going to kill him. The older brother says, hey, don't kill him. We shouldn't do that. Let's, let's get rid of him. And while he is thinking of a way to free his brother, the others, go and they take him. They see these traveling nomadic people, the Midianites. They bring Joseph out of the pit where they had thrown him in. They take him and they sell him to slavery. So the Midianites are responsible for the slavery of Joseph. They bought him. We also see the Midianites are involved with Balaam. Now, the king, of ba the king that is involved there is Balak. And I believe he is the king of Moab. But he goes and he talks to the elders of Midian, we're told in Numbers chapter 22. And that all of these people, this, these very descendants of Abraham, they are the ones who are fearful of Israel. They're the ones who are like, hey, we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't involve ourselves with these people. Let's go ahead and get rid of them. And they try to get Balaam to curse the Israelites. So we see again, Midian is involved there. Also, the people of Moab are in the same region, and some people believe that they are also just an offshoot, a sect of the Midianites. So two different occasions that we see and we deal with these people. But what about Sheba? You saw that name. That was a descendant of a descendant. That was the you know one of the sons. Well, Sheba would go off and he would establish a kingdom. And the queen of Sheba, all the way in 1 Kings chapter 10, would come and would basically with a great caravan of wealth, again, nomadic in nature, would come and praise and acknowledge the splendor that was Solomon. 
So not every one of these examples are bad. In fact, a lot of people believe that the Ethiopian eunuch is from Sheba, that that is the region that the Queen of Sheba was from, and that that could very well be the same people. But understand, we read of these people throughout the Bible. We see them interacting and, and dealing with the people. A lot of times it's good, a lot of times it's really bad. It all happens because, Moses, because Abraham has another wife, and then he takes these children, and he says, you go eastward, you go away from my son. He's protecting Isaac. Now, God told him to do this with Ishmael. Remember, Sarah says, get rid of this boy, I don't want him around my son, and Abraham's a little bit upset to do it, but then God comes to him and says, whatever she tells you to do, you do it, it's okay, it's right, move him away from Isaac. So he protects Isaac from Ishmael, but then he does the exact same thing with all of these children. He tells them, you go eastward, you go away from Isaac, and he gives them a gift where instead of that, he gives Isaac everything he has. This, again, points to the reality that Isaac was the chosen one. Abraham viewed Isaac as the promised one of God. He knew he was. And while those in the world, those who are Muslims, who say, oh, well, Ishmael was the chosen of, of Abraham. He was the one God wanted. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that Isaac was the one that God chose. Abraham chose to make sure Isaac was the sole heir to all he had. Uh, one another interesting bit of, of fact about this, I was reading an article, and I didn't get to see the exact purpose or the reason behind it, but a rabbi, speaking of the modern history of these people, said that most of the descendants of this wife refer to themselves as Ishmaelites now as well, that they basically just joined with Ishmael and those descendants, so they no longer consider themselves separate, but just all part of the same group. So again, you see this clash, this bitterness between Judaism and the old side cultures. And it all stems back to Abraham. Where does this going to lead for us? Well, we understand, we see that God had a purpose. God had a plan. And just with it, like with Ishmael, when we go above and beyond what God specifies, it only leads to trouble. It only leads to problems when we add more than what God wants us to do. So what's left? We're told that in the first six verses of 25, we're told that Abraham takes a wife. In the next several verses, we actually read of Abraham's death. And, and that's it. That this is where the story ends. He takes another wife. They have these children. He realizes, hey, I need to do something for these children. He sends them away to the east. He gives them gifts. Um, substantial, sure. I I'm, I'm have no doubt that they were still nothing compared to the actual inheritance that Isaac would get. And then we see that Abraham is now going to die. And the Bible's not very detailed. It doesn't do a, a large, thus ended Abraham, and here's all his achievements, and here's everything. It doesn't really do that far. Is it basically just very simple? It says, this is the sum of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. As we continue reading, his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machla, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zahar, the Hittite, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. So we see that Ishmael does come back, and obviously he and Isaac did have some form of relationship. The other sons are not mentioned. We know in the beginning of this that he had sent them eastward, 
but they apparently do not come back. They're not involved with the death of Abraham, which leads some to wonder, did they have a bad relationship because of losing out on their inheritance? What exactly happened there? But Ishmael comes, and together he and Isaac, they bury their father. The rest of the verse says that Abraham was buried, and Sarah his wife, and it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt at Beer Laha Ramor. Now, the remainder of chapter 25, we're not going to study it. In fact, we probably won't even look at it next week. Uh, the remainder of 25 breaks down the families of Ishmael and it breaks down the families of Isaac. And it lets us know that just because Abraham is gone, just because Abraham is done, God hasn't forgotten his promise. God hasn't forgotten what he told Abraham he was going to do. But now Isaac is the individual who is going to be the trace lineage. He's going to be the one which we're going to study and go through. And Isaac is the one who God's going to speak to and promise. And there's so many more things that he looks at and he says, you know what, basically here's the continuation of that. And it's fascinating that the Bible covers things this way. Abraham is significant to so many people in the world. You know, when we have people die today, there's been several celebrities, several people who are just outrageously famous for most of the time, no real good reason. And you know, people, you can't get on the internet without reading, oh, well, here's this new tribute from so-and-so towards what, you know, happened here. Oh, you know, this person said this, or that person said this, and, and there's whole long speeches written, and there's whole great, you know, they've done everything. You know, Google changed their entire platform one day to, to honor Betty White. Abraham meant something to so many people. And yet the Bible doesn't really do that much to acknowledge his death. Because his death is but a step. There's a very beautiful point in which the Bible tells us Abraham was gathered up to his people. Now it's talking about the reality that he is buried, that he has died, that he's gone. But it gives us the idea that now Abraham is at peace, he is at rest, and we understand and we know because the Bible tells us that Abraham is now in paradise. The Bible is not concerned with that much significance being placed on someone's death, but rather on the life that comes after. And when we read things like this, we look at what we read about Sarah again. Abraham warned her. There's a fitting tribute showing that he mourned her, that he did what was necessary to provide a place to bury her, that he was concerned about her. But the Bible doesn't really go into that much detail even on that. Because the Bible knows what we as children of God know. There is life to come. This is the final study of Abraham, yes. But one day we will meet Abraham. And how much more beautiful a statement can be made than that. This evening, we understand that Abraham lived a life that was fascinating. We know it because he's referred to as Father Abraham by the Israelites. We know it because in the book of Hebrews we have multiple examples of his faithfulness. Most people, when you look at the book of Hebrews, most people get one or two, one, maybe two little references. Abraham gets multiple references talking about what he did, what he and Sarah did, the faith they showed. And he is an example to us. He's also an example of what not to do. Don't lie about your wife being your half-sister. 
That might seem very specific, but that's basically what we learn. Don't lie. Don't lack of trust. Don't put your faith in something other than God. But don't swear that we learn from the life of Abraham that God is faithful. And when Abraham is now gone, as we're going to study in the next couple of weeks, his promise remains. That promise would end up being Christ, and through Christ we ourselves receive a new promise. And this evening I want to speak to you briefly about that new promise. The reality that we have been promised today that Christ will come again. He came to this earth, he died, he was buried, he resurrected. He now sits at the right hand of God, and he has promised us that he will return. And then we will stand before God, we will stand before Christ, and there will be a judgment, a day in which he looks at us and says, here is what you were told to do. I have the book of life. I have the word of God. I know exactly what you did. I know exactly what you were told to do. And we will give an answer for what we have done. God's promise is always kept. He kept it with Abraham. He kept it with Isaac. He kept it with Jacob. He kept it. We could go all the way down through the list. He will keep the promise he's made to us as well. This evening, if you are here and you are not a child of God, you have not done what is necessary to be His, then we encourage you, oh, let us study the Word of God with you. Let us open up His Word. Let us show you how through the act of baptism, one's life can have life. How through the act of baptism, we can put to death our old man, we can rise a new creature, and we can have eternal salvation with God. If you've done that in times past with someone along the way, you've stumbled off the course, you've allowed yourself to fall away, to go the path of so many others in the world. Let's pray for you. Let's encourage you. Let us guide you back. Because there is only one way. And that way is Christ. If you're here this evening, you need the prayers of the congregation. If there's anything we can do for you, now's the time. As we stand, as we sing. Why do you wake your sinner? Why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in his sanctuary.